right, now's the service where kids can come forward. All kids are invited to come up. We're going to talk about one of your favorite things today, guys, so come on up. Just like last week, the holidays are a time to remember, a time to reminisce, and when you're an old guy like me, we think a lot about what it was like when we were kids during the holidays, and so I'm going to share with you another memory that I have from when I was your age at Thanksgiving. But to illustrate that, we're again talking about thanks and giving, and we're going to focus a lot about, on the giving this week. Now, I want to ask a question. How many of you like toys? Now, the holidays are a time where parents and grandparents frantically look for the hottest toys to get their kids. So, uh, again, I don't have really small kids anymore. Tell me one toy that every kid wants this Christmas. Chloe, what's one toy kids want this Christmas? What do you think? Magnets. Is that what you said? Very cool. What we, what's one toy all kids want right now? Robot. Robot. What do you think? What's one toy all kids want? Hmm. Cool things. Cool things. What is one toy? Money. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You go to the store and get more. Camden, what, what is the toy all kids want this year? Legos. Legos. Yes. What do you think? No. Dreadlocks? Is that what you said? Door locks. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Brent. Nice. Very good. So, kids, if, and parents and grandparents, if you're wondering about what to get your kids or grandkids, can we see that first slide, please, Teresa? Now, that is the 2021 toy book from Walmart. Now, I went and tried to get one from Walmart, and they said, sir, we can't release this information until Thursday for the Black Friday sale. So, so parents, grandparents, just so you know, you can actually look at it digitally. There's 53 pages of wonderful toys. You got that, see? I didn't think, see? I told the Walmart person that they were wrong. You got like four of them? I should have asked you to bring one. I'm sorry, I wanted to look through it myself. But again, think of all the wonderful toys that are in there. I'm sure there's at least one toy that you would see in there and be like, oh, oh, I'd really like to get that. And so that reminded me, when I was your age, on Thanksgiving, after all of the adults were kind of uh, sleepy from eating too much turkey, all of our kids, all my cousins and I, would look through this. Does anyone remember that? Adults? Dean's like, yeah. Kids, this used to be sent in the mail to just about every family in America. It's called the Sears and Roebuck Wish Book. And this is from the year I was born, 1976. And so what we would do, and again, if you want to adopt this family tradition, that's fine. All of us kids, while the adults were taking a nap, what we would do is we would take note cards and we'd write down the top three toys that we would like looking through the Wish Book so that after they would wake up and it was time for pie and coffee, then what we would do is we would put all the kids' note cards in a basket and we'd take turns picking and then we'd kind of have a secret Santa and then we would get one of those three toys for our cousins. But here's the thing. Hang on. Do you have a quick question? What's your question? We did that house in my house. You do that at your house? That's awesome. See, the tradition lives on in the Emig family. But here's the thing. I'm going to be honest, kids. I was more excited to get toys than to give. But as I grew up, I realized that if we truly understand all that God has given us, we should be even more excited to take what God has given us and give it away. And now I know as a little kid, you're really excited about toys. But what we're going to see today is God's people were very naughty. Did they deserve to get a gift? No, they were very, very naughty. But we serve a gracious God. And he's going to talk to Moses about giving him an amazing gift of going with his people and watching over them, even when they're naughty. So that hopefully they can move from a heart of gratitude to a heart of giving. So good job listening, guys. You can grab a piece of candy before you return to your seats. All right. Camden, I'm going to have you be the candy bowl holder. Okay. Go ahead. And can you give those to everybody? That would be awesome. If you attend preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop. Miss Ashley's going to be your teacher today. She's awesome. Everyone else, if you can open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Oh, you didn't get me. Here you go, buddy. Good job. All right. 
If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being here. Normally, I don't spend so much time talking about toys, but it is the holiday season. As is often the tradition, kids are worried about what they're going to get for Christmas. And so I was looking through today's passage, and I was immediately reminded of myself as a child, looking forward to not spending time with my grandparents, but to look through that Sears and Roebuck catalog. What am I going to get? What am I going to get? And what we're going to see in today's passage is that that's the wrong heart for God's people to have as we continue this series called Thanks and Giving. Teresa, can we see that first slide, please? This, again, is this image where everything we have, the, the source of all the blessings in our life, whether that's toys, whether that's food, whether that's shelter, whether that's health, all of it is poured out from heaven onto us. And as we've been talking about, we shouldn't keep it for ourselves. We couldn't say, ha, 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 look at all that I'm getting. No, no, no. We should turn and look for different ways that we can bless other people. It doesn't have to be tangible gifts like toys, but it could be time. It could be investment. It could be helping out when someone is in need. And as we think about that, we understand that. We recognize that throughout this series, we have to have, sort of have a, a mindset change where not that what we're going to get, but we should live, as we saw last week, a lifestyle of thanks living. And if we do that, and if we do that well, it should give us this heart where we want to give. We want to serve other people in any way we can. And so as we're going to look at this, you have to understand that today's passage takes place during a very turbulent time for God's people. If you remember, Moses was given the Ten Commandments, and as he came down from Mount Sinai, what did he find God's people do? They were worshiping a golden calf that they had made. They broke the covenant. God said, you should have no other gods before me. Moses is gone for a short time. And then what do they do? They build this golden calf. And so Moses, out of frustration, smashes the two tablets. But then God says, you know what? I'm going to forgive you. I know you've been naughty, but I'm going to give you something amazing. I'm going to be there for you as you go on this journey. And so today's passage takes place when Moses goes back up the mountain with two new tablets, wondering if God is truly going to forgive them and continue to pour his blessings out. But as we did throughout all of Old Testament and New Testament history, it's really hard for God's people to figure out what it means to be in a covenant community. They keep messing things up. And so the three things that we're going to learn in today's text, Therese, can we see it? Three important lessons I hope to present this morning. How we should be thankful to God when we experience his presence. Number two, how should we be thankful to God when he reveals his character so that we may know him better? And third, how we should be thankful when God holds up his side of the covenant promises, even we act like stiff-necked people. And so keep that in mind as we look at just a few verses today of chapter 34, starting with verse 4. It will be up on the screen. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. As he carried two stone tablets in his hands, then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. As God passed in front of Moses, he proclaimed again, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, Forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And so when we think of all the different nations in the world at this time, only the Israelites had been given this amazing ability to learn from the Lord how they were supposed to live in this world. Now, how many of you have ever purchased a new car? How many of you took the time to look through the owner's manual of that new car? Very good. Now, a lot of people, maybe out of pride, would be like, nah, I've driven cars before. But my boys and I continue to watch these commercials, and I don't know if you've seen them. 
But they're driving on a highway, and it makes them cringe every time. Have you seen these commercials where they're driving down the highway, and they push a button, and then they put their hands down, and they're like, And you have like whole groups of people without their hands on the steering wheel driving down at 80 miles an hour. And every time Asher and Judah are like, you're going to crash, you're going to crash, you're going to crash. Why is that? Because modern cars now have the ability, if you didn't know, to drive themselves. Raise your hand and be like, no, thank you. Thank you. See, Asher, Judah, we're not so odd. Every, my whole family is like, no way. Even if it had that function, we would be like, please take it out. We don't want it there. And so in that case, you better read the owner's manual. Because can you imagine if you like crashed into something and the police officers, why did you take your hands off the wheel? Well, because I pushed the button and I was supposed to do it. Did you read the manual? No. Imagine the horror. And so for God's people, you have to keep in mind that the Ten Commandments were sort of like the owner's manual for the Israelites to know how they were supposed to live. They had to not keep their hands off. They had to be active in maintaining this covenant relationship because out of all the other nations, they were chosen. They were set apart to be these amazing people that were going to be the light to the nations. And so you can imagine Moses... In his trepidation, he's got two new tablets so that God could write on them, the Ten Commandments, and he's slowly walking up this mountain carrying these very heavy tablets. And as he's carrying up those stone tablets, I want you to imagine for a minute what that would be like. Now, I'm not looking at anybody in particular, but there have been times over the past 13 years when I've invited people to come to worship at Red Arrow, they immediately say, oh, no, man. If I walk in there, I'm going to get struck by lightning. The whole place is going to go on fire if I walk into that place. No way, no how. Now, why would someone say that? Why would someone say, if I go into that church, I'm going to get struck by lightning? Well, there's an implied awareness that maybe they've been kind of naughty in the past. There, there's an awareness that when you come to church, and again, we often call this place the ministry center, right? Because we know that the church is the people, not the building. God forbid if this building burned down, Red Arrow Ministries would continue because it's the, the people. But this idea that if I walk into the church, that's where the presence of God is, and boy, oh boy, he's not going to be happy with me. And <clears throat> Now, that's not the kind of God we serve, but yet that's the anxiety when you enter into God's presence. So imagine Moses whose entire nation, while he was gone for a short period of time, built an idol and started worshiping it. What I love is, did you know the punishment? They ground up the gold and they made the people drink it. Oh, yeah. Now again, that's kind of harsh. Well, what did they do wrong? They worshiped another God. They broke covenant. So again, I don't know if Moses is feeling like he's going to get struck by lightning or not, but he's representing God's people. He goes up to the mountain when suddenly God's presence shows up. He passes in front. He comes down in a cloud. Now, if you were truly saw God for who he was, you would like melt. And so clearly God manifested himself in a physical form in a cloud. It was called the Shekinah glory cloud. I'm sure it was blinding. It was so blinding later on in the next few chapters. When Moses comes out, his face is actually glowing. Remember those glow-in-the-dark stickers or glow-in-the-dark toys if you hold it next to a light for a while and then you walk away and it's still glowing? That was Moses' face because he was in the presence of God's glory. And so he comes in here and he's got this amazing experience and he realizes that he's in the presence of God. Now, I know we have several business owners here, so I'm going to pick on Amy a little bit. Amy, let's just say that your photography company was just doing so well that you wanted to branch out, and she wanted a Deming photography in every major city in Michigan. Now, if Amy wanted to do that, she's going to look for a business partner because she works really, really hard. We just did our family photos for, saw the proofs, well done. I mean, we are a motley looking crew, so you made us look really handsome. But if Amy wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and not only just expand her business, but start other, but she needed a partner. Now, Amy, if you were looking for a business partner, I think there's probably some criteria in your head. And, and so let's look if these would be an, an appropriate thing. Here's a list of character traits that you want to avoid when entering into a contract with someone. 
Someone who is uncaring, disrespectful, bad-tempered, unloving, unfaithful, unforgiving, and despising goodness, loyalty, and obedience. Amy, would you want to get into an agreement with that person? No. Not at all. Why? Because that's not someone you can trust. That's not someone you want to enter into a relationship with. And so with that contrast in mind, if your Bibles are still open, look at how God himself expresses his characters and he gives us a sense of his identity. Halfway through six, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Now, if Amy had a business partner with those qualities, I'm sure she'd jump at that opportunity to enter into a relationship with them. For God's people, they had to be reminded that from all the other nations of the world, only the Israelites at this point in time could look to that kind of God to enter into an agreement. Now, I don't know about you, I love the fact that God revealed his character to Moses. And so just like Moses, I think if I was up there, okay, I would say, oh, that's amazing, all good stuff, but notice there's a second part. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Now, sometimes when people read passages like this, they get upset and they say, now wait a minute, Ben, if God is love, that sounds really mean, that God punishes his people when they're naughty, right? Well, I often think about it, and I think I was sharing this with Mark Emick as we got some chairs up north, how our daughter Marissa, when she was two, we lived in a duplex right by a busy street, she would constantly, as soon as the door opened, she would go running for the busy street. I don't know why she did this. She thought it was fun, I think. And I would grab her, I'd say, Marissa, no. And I'd spank her hand. Daddy, you're mean! Marissa, if you're watching, I'm really sorry. I told you I'd never tell this story again, but if it's so well, I had to do it. Daddy, you're mean! Now, was I being mean? No. It was out of love that I was punishing her so she would learn not to go running in a busy street. I would be a lousy parent if we didn't punish her for running out in the street. And so we have to understand that if a God is truly as loving and gracious, he also has to be just. And yes, when someone breaks the covenant community, there's going to be consequences. People are going to get hurt. And so maybe you're saying, Ben, I still don't get it. If God is love, why would he hold us accountable? Well, I, I was right. At this point in my sermon, I'm like, Lord, how am I supposed to finish the sermon? And then I had this great experience yesterday. Can we see it, please? This is an Eagle Scout Honor Court. How many of you have ever been to one of these? It was pretty awesome. Any Eagle Scouts in our midst? Ah, it's a rare group. But here's the thing. That is Aaron West. Aaron and Alex are members of our church. Aaron I got to invest in for many, many years. And now he and his brother finally reached the rank along with two other young men of Eagle Scout. And they're like, Pastor Ben, would you bring the invocation? I'm like, sure. This place was packed yesterday. We had this great experience and what struck me and why I bring it into the sermon is because not just one, not just two, but three different older gentlemen, one of them was in a wheelchair. I don't know how elderly he was. I'm guessing like in the 90s. This gentleman, wow, he was an Eagle Scout. And he said, and these other older Eagle Scouts said, you know what, boys? When you take off that uniform, guess what? You're still an Eagle Scout. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, you are always an Eagle Scout. And I said, well, why? Why would they say that? And they explained, because there is such high expectations to be part of that elite group that no matter where they were or what they were doing, they will represent something bigger than themselves. And I said, that's it. The Israelites were supposed to represent God to the nations. And so, of course, he's going to hold them up to this high standard. And if they fail, he's going to make God look bad. And so, of course, there's going to be consequences when God's people fall away and don't live up to the high calling that he has given us. Thank you. And so as we look at this end result here, Moses did what all of us should do. Bow down, worshiping the Lord, saying, if you found favor in your eyes, if we, if I have found favor 
then let the Lord go with us because that's the ultimate thing. Remember, they're in the wilderness, they're surrounded by enemies, they're on their way to the promised land, and the number one thing that Moses is concerned about is God going to be with us. The number one, I can't say number one, one of the greatest struggles for people today is they feel alone. They feel like nobody knows what they're going through. This is a direct result of the fall when we were separated from God's presence. And Moses wants to know, are we going to be alone in this journey? Or are you going to be with us? Now, why is that even an issue? Not only were they naughty, but look at what Moses says. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and sin and take us as an heirs. Now, let's look just briefly to end here. What does stiff-necked people mean? Well, that is a Hebrew idiom. Describes someone who's extremely obstinate or stubborn. Does anyone know anyone like that? I'm pointing to myself right now. Okay. Today we might use the phrase extremely hard-headed. Now before we give Moses a hard time for describing God's people in such a derogatory way, we must remember that God himself used this phrase to describe his own people several times. Why? Over and over and over and over and over again, God's people failed to live up to their calling. Therefore, how thankful should we be to know that God always, I'm going to read that again, God always holds up his side of the covenant promise, even when we act like such a stiff-necked people. <coughs> so thinking back to the children's illustration, by a show of hands, how many remember the Sears catalog? Now again, I know that Emmy's son said that they do this. How many of you ever did something like that that we did in my family where you look through the wish book and you pick some things? Okay, so it wasn't just my family. I thought it was special, but that's okay. Again, how, how does a parent or a grandparent or an aunt and uncle who only gets to see the kids maybe a few times a year know exactly which toys they really, really would get excited about? And so again, as a kid, we fought over that Sears catalog. I want to see it. It's my turn. No, I only have two. I need one more. And, I, and we would sit there, and I remember I was so excited. Are the, are the parents still napping? Yes, they're still napping. Good, we still have time. It's the trip to fan, kids. There's something in Turkey that puts parents to sleep. Don't take it personally, okay? Please. But I remember getting a little bit older, a little bit wiser. And I remember that transition where I stopped getting as excited to get and started to get excited about what I could give. And sadly, in our society, I think we can all agree that a lot of adults have not made that transition for what am I going to get into what I can get. Because if we truly understand who our God is, all of us should not just have a lifestyle of thanks living, that we should move in our maturity to know what can I give to help a person in need. Because again, go back. Notice getting is not part of this season series. It's thanks and giving. Now, what am I going to get? No, 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 no. Sometimes God's people, and even in the church of today, come to a worshiping community like this, and all they want to know is, what do we get out of it? What are we going to get? Instead, wow, what a privilege it is to be part of a covenant community where I can serve the Lord in this capacity. That I can use my gifts even to serve coffee and cookies. That's a gift. All of you have amazing gifts that God has poured out on you. And so ask yourself, what are you doing to give of those gifts in service to the Lord? And so we end with, let's ask, well, what does it look like? If we could see the next slide, please. When we truly understand how thankful we ought to be, one, to experience God's presence in our lives, right? It is a privilege to be here right now, even if you're watching online, because we know God's presence is here. He goes with you, but there's something special about corporate worship. Two, to learn the amazing reality of God's character. All the other nations of the world kind of have to wonder what their God is like. Our God revealed it to us. We know what our God is like. And to know that God always keeps his promises, even when we don't, then our response should demonstrate to everyone we meet a thankful heart moving towards a giving heart. But what does that look like? Let's look at the response of God's people responding with thankful hearts for the Lord graciously renewing his covenant with them. Because in the very next chapter of Exodus, this is what we see. Moses summoned those who were put in charge of building the tabernacle. Remember, 
That's where the presence of God would dwell among his people. Along with all of whom God had gifted with the ability to work skillfully with their hands, right? So this is our, our coffee and cookies team. That's the analogy there. Our, our tech booth team, Therese and, and Gabe doing a great job. These are all the people engaged in the work. And they, they took from Moses all the offerings that the Israelites had brought for the work of constructing the sanctuary. The people kept on bringing their free will offerings morning after morning. All of the artisans who were at work making everything involved in constructing the sanctuary came one after another to Moses saying, the people are bringing more than enough for doing this work that God has commanded us to. So Moses sent out orders through the camp, men, women, no more offerings for building the sanctuary. The people were ordered to stop bringing offerings. There was plenty of material for all the work to be done. Trees leave it here, enough and more than enough. Imagine, now again, we don't pass the plate anymore, traditionally, but wouldn't it be awesome when Maria's doing the stewardship journey moment that we would all be like, whoosh, that the computer would like, eh, 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 too much money, too much money, eh, 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 eh. like there'd be a whole line of people as we sign up for wonderful things like hospitality that we have to add 10 pages, right? That's the sort of inspiration that God's people had. And you have to ask yourself, well, did it last? No. They failed. And they failed again. And they broke the covenant. All the way up to in Jesus' time. When the Son of God Himself came to this earth to give His life for all those times that we fall short of living up to God's expectations for creation. And what did He do? When He was on the cross, even though they had seen the miracles, even though they had heard the words, they crucified our Lord. Therese, can we see what he said? As we look at that image, and that's why I went up and I fixed the cross. This Tuesday, we're going to have pie and praise. And yes, we're excited to have pie. And yes, the youth ministry team is going to do a great job leading worship. But we're also here to go to that table because that table reminds us of the cross. And what did Jesus say when he was up there? Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. And so ask yourself this holiday season, knowing that God has given us the ultimate gift, meaning his life. What can I give to God for all the steadfast love he has shown us? Please pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for your word today. Lord, in the consumeristic society that we live in, it is challenging for us to not think about what we're going to get, but rather what we're going to give. And Lord, help us to have that same heart of generosity that inspired your people to give more than enough for building of the sanctuary. Lord, I know for some people, their gift is going to be sitting with a person in a hospital bed. That their gift to you is going to be encouraging someone who's feeling very alone. And so Lord, you've poured out so many gifts in our ministry here at Red Arrow. Lord, use us as a light to this world, even in this holiday season, even as we gather with friends and family. Let us not be worried so much about what we're going to get out of that experience, but rather what we can give to another person so that they too can experience your love. And as we come to the table on Tuesday, let us never forget that we need to ultimately and finally say, God, thank you for saving me. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.